Y'all should have known you could have been out here for a while, but, but you didn't bring any food. But no, he had compassion on them. And how long did it take him to bless all that food to where when the disciples kept coming back and kept going out and coming back and going out? Because it says the disciples served. How long do you think it's going to take 12 guys to go out and feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children? That's going to take a little bit. I don't know how long the Lord stood up there just kept on breaking off bits of fish and bread and it just kept lasting and lasting and lasting. I don't know. But I do know he did it out of compassion. He wasn't concerned about the time. He wasn't concerned about how long. He wasn't concerned about the disciples thinking, man, my feet are really starting to hurt. Man, you know what? I'm getting a cramp down in my hamstring. No, because the disciples, once eventually, did, I don't know, but if they would have gotten past that, the feeling of, man, I don't want to do it. But man, can you imagine? I've been back like at least two, three hundred times, and there's still as much fish down there as there was when I took the first load up. I don't know how Jesus is doing this. Right? I could swear there's more bread down there right now than there was when that kid brought that basket up. Right? When we get our mind off of us, then we can see not only the blessing that we get to maybe be a part of in somebody else's life, but how we're a recipient of, the, of a blessing just by being around and letting God use us maybe to perform a blessing for somebody else. You say, that can't happen. That happens all the time. We're just too tuned out and focused on us to be noticed about it. And we don't care about being kind or compassionate or just not being jerks. And then we fall into the rhythm of the world. And if the world sees nothing different in us, why would they want what we have? That guy is a bigger jerk than anybody else on the job. And he claims to be a Christian. You say, that doesn't happen. Well, they may not say that out loud, but they think that way. When they go home and they're thinking about things on the job, when they're trying to lay their head down on the pillow at night, they're like, man, I can't believe that guy did that. And did, you remember that? And as soon as they remember, man, I can't believe that guy did that today, the devil will put the thought in their mind, yeah, and that person said they were a Christian. That person gave you a track one time. How can we hope to win the world without compassion for the world? How can we hope to win the world if we don't have compassion for one another? Because we are a part of one body under Christ. How can we expect for that body to go out and be efficient if we don't help each other do it along the way? Right, but we spent too much time on that point. Got to keep going. Okay, verse number 10. I want you to notice the consequences. These are good consequences. They're not bad consequences, but they're good consequences. For he that will love life and see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. What's that mean? Well, it means if you want to love life, in other words, if you want to love waking up every day and living for the Lord. Peter's saying, if you want to be in love with the life that God gave you, if you want to see good days, he's saying you do these things. Let him refrain his tongue from evil. Don't speak evil. And his lips that they speak no guile. What's guile? That's anything that's not truth. So what is that saying? Well, James put it this way. It's an amazing thing that the tongue is so small a member, but yet it can steer the course of the whole body. It can set the whole body on fire. Is what James said. Right. The rudder, that's the word I'm looking for, of a ship steers the entire thing, but you go and do some measurements, you're going to find out that boat's a whole lot bigger than that rudder. Right, compared to how big a horse is, especially if it's a big horse, like one of them Clydesdales, right, as big as that horse is, that bit's real small in its mouth. Yet, that bit determines where that horse is going to go, how fast it's going to go, whether it's going to stop, whether it needs to slow down. Right, same way with our tongue with our lips let him eschew evil what's that mean hate evil look at evil and recognize it as the thing that keeps you farther away from God and hate it because it does that don't hate it because well if I do that I'm going to hurt somebody no I hate evil because evil keeps me away from God that's why I hate it I don't hate evil because I'm going to have to pay the price for evil I don't hate evil because evil may make somebody think different of me. I hate evil because it keeps me from being smack dab right up against God. 
and in constant fellowship with them. The other things are just a byproduct. The reason I hate evil is because God hates evil and I'm going to be as close to God as I can. Then, goes on to say, let them seek peace and ensue it. It's one thing to say, you know what, Brother Brian, I hope that God works that out in your life. It's another thing that if Brother Brian and I have an ought with one another, right, maybe it's because I, he sent me a text message, I didn't respond to him for two days because I forgot about it. I read it, forgot about it, didn't respond to him. I go to call him back up. He goes, you know what, you told me you were going to be there for me, and you weren't. All right, I'm wrong on that. What's this verse say? Seek peace and into it. It's one thing to say, well, Brother Brian, I'm sorry, I don't hope God works this out between us. It's another thing to say, Lord, what do you want me to do in order to fix this situation? Lord, how do I mend that between Brian and... Or, Lord, I didn't do anything wrong, but there's something messed up here. Maybe I'm not at fault, like I was in that example. Maybe it's just something that happened somewhere else. But because that happened, now there's strife between me and this person. Lord, it's one thing to say, well, I hope God works this out. It's another thing to say, Lord, I know you're going to work this out, but show me what I have to do. Ensue it. It's one thing to say, well, I hope that God brings peace. It's another thing to say, Lord, what do you want me to do in order to make sure that there is peace? Ensue it means you do everything that you can do under the will of God. Don't do something you're not supposed to do. But do everything that God tells you to do to ensure that there is peace. It's one thing for you to sit there. You can, well, not sit. You're probably going to be standing. But if you're in the kitchen and you follow all the instructions for a recipe and then you don't put it in the oven, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Likewise, you could turn the oven on, but unless you do everything else according to the recipe, it's not going to turn out right. If you pull it out too soon, if you leave it in too long, there are a lot of variables that go into pulling something out and actually being able to eat it. And more importantly, it tasting good. A lot of things that can go wrong throughout the way. Ensuing it means you make sure that everything's done right down to the last dot, down to the last I being dotted and the T being crossed. God, I've done everything according to your will. Then, if something goes awry, you can stand before God and say, I did everything you told me to. But really the reason you're doing it is because you have compassion for the other person. Lord, I don't want this to be the reason that something go wrong in either their life or my life. I don't want this to be the reason that somebody dies and goes to hell. Lord, if I'm, the reason, if I'm a burr under somebody else's saddle, Lord, get me out of the way. Show me how to, you know, smooth this thing over. Because, Lord, I want them to have a good life. Well, you know what all of this has to do with your focus Peter's encouraging everybody in the verses that we've just read don't think about you think about others and why can he say that if you seek peace if you ensue it if you keep your lips from uh, speaking guile right let your tongue say no evil thing do no evil thing but do good things instead what's all that about well it's not because of you you're doing those things for others because you are a servant because we've already talked about being of one mind and that mind being the mind that was in Christ Jesus but how can he say you're going to have good days and you're going to love life if you do those things because if you're focused about others be not deceived God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap if you do good to others God will make sure that you're blessed with good but then he goes even further than that he's saying you'll see fruit abounding in your life you'll see God doing things and that will cause you to love life and even on the darkest days you'll see good because you're focused on what God wants you to be doing and if you're focused on what God's doing there's always going to be something that he's doing it's going to be a good day but then he goes on to say who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good but now if you suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Well, verse number 13. It's another way of saying, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can harm you if you be followers of that which is good? 
If you're smack dab in the middle of what God wants you to be doing, who can touch you unless God ordained it? So really, is that a harm? Or is it the will of God that I decrease so that he can increase in my life? Paul had a thorn in the flesh, but by the time he was done with it, it wasn't a thorn to him anymore. It was a blessing. Because he saw that God's strength is made perfect in his weakness. He's saying, I get to see more of God's grace, more of God's goodness, and more of God's strength in my life because of this thing. It's not a thorn anymore. It's a blessing. It may not be convenient, but it's a blessing. How many people have had that thorn? Well, as far as I know, that was the thorn that God chose to give to the Apostle Paul. He's the only one that ever got to see that kind of, specifically, that grace, that mercy, that strength, that blessing that God had for him. What are we missing out on in our lives because we don't want to suffer the harm? The harm to what? The flesh? It's going back to the dirt. I don't care what happens to this sucker. Is it going to be convenient? No, there's still some days I wake up, I got nerve pain down my left leg. You know what that makes me do? Well, one, it makes me appreciate the fact that now I work for a lady that's pretty good at taking care of that stuff. But two, it also makes me appreciate the days that I don't have nerve pain. also makes me appreciate the days that I don't have back spasms. Because guess who threw out his back on Wednesday? Because of a stupid garbage can. But anyway, we won't get into that. Point is, the things that so often we want God to remove, he's... It's not for our harm. We see it as a harm, but maybe that's because we're thinking too much about us, not about others. Maybe that's because we're th too busy thinking about what we want rather than what God wants. He's saying, if somebody does something to you, if you're in the smack dab will of God, how can it be bad for you? Because if you're right where God wants you to be, that's not a harm. That's just a blessing that you don't want to accept. That is something that God has specifically allowed to happen in your life so that he can either be magnified or his grace and mercy that you haven't known up to that point can be revealed unto you. Because let's be honest, if sin had its way, we would have been destroyed a long time ago. And it wouldn't have been a harm, it would have been a destruction. Now Peter's saying, really, this is the guy who after he denied Christ three times, after he told God that he wouldn't do it, and Jesus said, no, you, you're going to do it, before the rooster crows. But that guy, the guy who was so embarrassed that he said, you know what, I'm going fishing, because I can't deal with being around the people of God anymore. It's making me feel too guilty. And then some of them people that he was trying to get away from said, yeah, we're going with you. And he was like, fine, you go get on that ship over there, because go to study it out. There were more than one ship. He said, I can't stand to be around you. You guys go over there. Then John says, hey, Peter, I see the Lord. He jumps in the water because he's not dressed the way that he should be. But really, that was just an outward representation. And spiritually, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't concerned about the things. He saw everything that happened as a harm. But this is older Peter. This is wiser Peter. This is the Peter that's seen God do some things and junked his flesh and allowed God to use him to preach a message on the day of Pentecost that all those thousands of people got saved that allowed him to use him to help be the leader of the other apostles there at the church of Jerusalem to lead that church. What's he noticed? It wasn't a harm. Did he mess up? Yep. Did he have to go through the sifter? Yep. But he said, what the devil thought was going to destroy me, God had a blessing in it. And if I didn't embrace it, I wouldn't have received that blessing. It would have been a harm if I didn't get on the side of the Lord if I wouldn't have understood okay this isn't for my destruction this isn't for my hurt this is for my blessing they can try to do evil to me but God's going to use it for his honor and his glory which means it's not a harm will it hurt yeah it hurts when you tackle somebody especially if you hit them real good but you still made the tackle that's good right you can get plowed as a quarterback but if you let go of that ball a little bit sooner it's a touchdown you got, pla you got hit, and your helmet's turned around sideways, but you made the touchdown. 
Right? What others intend to hurt you, God can use it to bless you. But, but then, so he deals with harm. He says, there's no harm. If you be followers of that, which is good. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Well, that doesn't make sense to the flesh. If we are sufferers for righteousness' sake, happy. Suffer and happy don't go together. They are what English teachers will tell you is an antonym. They're opposites. Suffering and happiness can't go together. It's just like dry and wet. You can't be dry and wet at the same time. Okay, and I know there are people out there thinking, well, my hair can be wet and the rest of me can be dry. Part of you's wet, that means you're wet. Okay, if part of your dog's wet, you don't want the wet dog rubbing up against you, even though the rest of them's dry. I promise you. Right? But all of that, being contrary one to another, why is it that we can be happy? Well, not only can we be happy, we can be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. What's that mean? Well, instead of being afraid, you're comforted. Instead of being troubled, you're at peace. Why is that? And really, we're not just talking about the suffering. We're also talking about those that would love life and see good days. How are those people focused on others so much? How are those people always asking the Lord, Lord, how would you have me react in this situation? I want to have peace, not just with those that I'm friendly with, but those that may consider themselves my enemy. I want peace for them, Lord. Show me how to have peace in my life. Show me how to love life and see good days. Show me how to view the harms that other people would do to me as blessings. How do they do that? How are those that suffer, those that from the outside looking in, there's no way that they should be happy, but yet they're some of the happiest people in the world. Why is that? Because of verse number 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer unto every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience. We'll stop there for a second. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. What is the purpose of sanctification? That's where you take something that used to be, it could have belonged to you, it could have belonged to a couple of different people, but they come together and they say, this used to belong to us, but we want to give it to God. And in order for God to use it, we have to sanctify it. Because God's not going to use a dirty vessel. God is not going to inhabit a dirty vessel. God cannot use a dirty vessel for his honor and his glory. Because in order for God to use it, it has to be given to God a certain way, has to be cleansed a certain way, there has to be a process under the Old Testament that had to be followed before God would accept an offering off of an altar. Because until it was sanctified, that wasn't God's altar. That was the altar that the Israelites had made. Until they sanctified all those things that went into Solomon's temple. That wasn't God's temple. It was Solomon's temple. But when it was sanctified, they were saying, Lord, we built this for you, for your use. We don't have any claim to this anymore. It's yours. It's no longer ours. We gave it, and because we gave it willingly, it's yours. Not mine. Do whatever you want to with it, God. It's yours. We cleansed it according to your will. We did what we were supposed to do with it. So, Lord, use it and honor it, and we're just going to keep showing up to see what you're doing with it because we're just excited to see what God's doing. We're going to keep showing up with sacrifices, with offerings unto God, because we love and appreciate him so much but Lord even on the days that I'm feeling the worst that's still yours I can't take it back but when he says sanctify your hearts sanctify the Lord God in your hearts what's that saying well I've heard people say that there's that secret place in your, if there's a secret place in your heart your whole heart's not sanctified unto God it's not about giving God the biggest part of your heart it's about giving God your whole heart 
He's saying, sanctify the Lord God. In other words, everything that God doesn't want out of there, get out. But if God still allows it to be there, sanctify it unto his use. God may not be saying that there's something in your heart that you got a junk. He's just saying, let me have it. He may be saying, well, see, there's this part of your heart that has compassion for some people. He's saying, I want to use that to have compassion for everybody. But because it's not sanctified, every time the Lord says, hey, have pity on that person. Hey, show that person compassion. Hey, be generous to that person. Don't render evil because you've received evil. Instead, render good. That part of me that's capable of showing compassion, if it's not sanctified unto God, I'm going to say, no, Lord. I'm going to be evil to that person because they were evil to me. You know what that means? God doesn't have my whole heart. When somebody does harm to me and my first reaction is to go do harm unto them, God doesn't have my whole heart. Because that part of my heart that says, hey, be compassionate to them. That part of my spirit that's in fellowship with his spirit that says, hey, Jesus, as he's on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Because really, let's break it down. Why are they doing harm to me? Because of sin. And I wasn't able to take away my own sin. I wasn't able to help my own problem with my sin. I wasn't able to find the cure for sin on my own. They're just doing what sin does naturally in them. And really, what is sin? Uh, it's not flesh and blood that I wrestle against, against principalities. It's against powers. It's ruler dark, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. What's all of that? That's the fact that this world's cursed. Their flesh is cursed. My flesh is this cursed. We've said it. My flesh is going back to the ground because it's cursed. It didn't get saved. My soul did. Everything in this world is tainted and cursed by sin. But that person's soul, that's eternal. And if it takes compassion, I want to have compassion on that person. Because God had compassion on me. Somebody else had compassion on me to teach me about Jesus, to show me the truth, to show me the way of salvation, so that when God dealt with me about it, I could be saved. I wasn't ignorant of the fact of how to receive Christ as my Savior. So I want to have compassion on them. And they, they may meant to have harmed me. And I may bleed. I got a paper cut the other day. Guess what? It's gone. In all honesty, it didn't even hurt that much. I didn't notice it until later when I looked down and there was a drop of blood on a different piece of paper. But I didn't even notice it until later. Sometimes people are going to try to harm you and then later you're going to say, Oh, Lord, that person gave me a paper cut. You're going to look down to go do something and say, Huh, I didn't even feel that. When we're more focused on the good that God wants to do, most of the harms that we're worried about getting, we won't even notice in fact, there are some things that you're going to build up a callus to. Anybody remember first, second grade when they were trying to teach you how to write letters and everything? You'd come home at the end of the day. Most of the time you couldn't even get through the class. Your middle finger on whichever hand you are writing with is killing you. Yep. Teacher, it hurts. But by the time you got done through school, what do you have? Well, if you're me, you got a real big callus right there. But Brother Clint who plays guitar for us on Sunday nights and then every now and then when he's singing specials. When he started playing guitar, his fingers hurt. He's sitting there and he's thinking, man, how, it's not worth the music that I want to play dealing with this pain. But as he did it, over and over and over, now it doesn't hurt no more. But now, the things that used to hurt him, God can use as a blessing, not just for other people in the church, but God also inhabits the praise of his people. Those days that he's hurt by something else, he can go back and play the guitar and say, you know what, Lord? I remember when this used to hurt. But now you've turned it into a good. So this thing that hurts me right now, I'm just going to have faith that you're going to use it for good. We can't get to the point where the hurt isn't what our focus is on anymore. Why is that? Because God has all of our heart. Our heart is a selfish thing by nature. It cares about me. It is attached to me. It has to deal with me all day long. So, of course, the heart wants to look out for itself. 
And the heart in the scripture is the seat of all emotion. Why does the heart want to do something for somebody else? So that it can receive in return. Well, I'll do good to them, so they'll do good to me. No, I do good to others whether or not they receive it, whether I receive good from them at all. Why? Because one, I care about them because God cares about them, but also, if I want to see good days, if I want to love life, I have to do what God wants me to do. I do good to others because if I don't, it separates me from God. I give God my whole heart because I care more about what God thinks. I care more about my relationship with God than I do with other people. And really, if you're sold out unto God and somebody rejects you or rejects the time when you try to present them with the gospel, their opinion doesn't matter. I mean, is it going to hurt? Yeah. But in comparison to what God thinks about you, doesn't doesn't matter. They could try to harm you. They could try to cut you down. But hey, they don't understand that their opinion isn't as, port, as important as they think it is. Took me a long time to get that, brother. I don't get why people just don't understand the Bible. The way. Well, first off, they may not have had the Bible upbringing, right? I did spend a lot of time in Sunday school. There were some things that I didn't get as a kid that somebody had to sit down and teach me and get. I still never forget, Brother Lawrence. It took him about nine years, which is an exaggeration. But I remember in teens class when he tried to, you know, explain to a bunch of teenagers what propitiation was. How Jesus became the propitiation for our sin. Yeah, that, that's a pretty dense doctrine there, Brother Lawrence. He had booklets in there. It took us a while to get through it. But guess what I can do now? Teach others about propitiation. As a result, but see, it took some time. It took some effort. But I can... They're really not going to understand the things of the Bible if they don't have the Spirit indwelling them because the Word is spiritually discerned. Lord, how come they just don't get it? It used to hurt me. But now when somebody says, oh, that's not what that means, I'm, I try, if I sit down and explain, no, that is what it means, and here's why. If they reject it, their opinion doesn't mean as much to me anymore. Because that still small voice that says, hey, you're right. Yep, that's the way that I showed it to you. That means more to me than what somebody else thinks. In fact, Paul thought so little of what other people thought. They wanted to make him a god. Y'all do realize that, right? In Athens. He showed up and started preaching. They wanted to make him and his traveling companion. They thought that one, that they were gods, and they thought that they were Mars and Jupiter. They wanted to build temples to them right then and there. And he said, junk all that garbage. I'm going to tell you about the real God. Somebody that's doing the things of God only for an opportunity for somebody to say, hey, we want to do something for you. And then they junk the things of God really weren't in it why because I don't do these things to receive a blessing I do these things because they get me closer to God I do these things so that I have a better fellowship with my heavenly father and if I want to receive good I have to do good that's just the way that God set up the universe that's the way that God saw fit to put things together and to frame this world that we live in and because sin naturally separates people from God, there are going to be some things that people don't get. But the closer I get to God, the more things that people mean as harm, He's going to turn into good. And He won't let them do something that's really going to harm me. Because it's His will that, one, I stay close to Him, and two, I continue and am able to continue to do things for Him. So why would He allow me to be crippled unless He's got either a prosthetic or a wheelchair coming in my direction? Right, well, it may seem facetious. But you could be sitting in a wheelchair thinking, man, can't believe I'm in a wheelchair. Or you could be sitting there and saying, well, the guy could have taken off both legs. One of these days I'm going to get back up after this thing heals. But you remember all them times on the job that I was wishing, man, I could take a seat? Now I've got a seat. Maybe the Lord just knew that, hey, well, he didn't take your leg from you. You're going to be in a wheelchair for a little bit. You might be on crutches for a little bit. But he just gave you a time to rest. What the world meant to cripple you, now God's turned it into a space of grace to rest so that when you do get back up on your feet, you're out there and you're not deterred. You're not weak any longer. You're not vulnerable anymore. And if you're like Christian that's hurt his knees so many times that we lost track, guess what? If the world tries to throw something at your knee, now he's got a whole drawer full of knee braces 
Well, it's hurting today, but God gave me this to help me get through this. I'm going to go back and use that verse again. I'm going to go back and listen to that message again. Because that will put a brace on it so that I don't get hurt again. I'm feeling it, so I'm going to go back to that thing that I know helped me last time so that this time I don't get hurt as bad and I can continue to push through it rather than it hurting me. Too many times we're looking for God to show up with the answer that's just going to be the miracle cure-all. But most of the time he's already given it to you and it's either in your spiritual medicine cabinet or wherever in your house you put things that you know you really don't need anymore but you might need one day like knee braces or back braces or something, something like that. God's already given it to you. We just don't go back and use it again. Or we forget about it. What do you do if you're having a headache? Well, you can either suffer through it or take Excedrin or Ibuprofen. Why? Because I know that that takes it away. Why would you suffer through something? Because sometimes, if you're not spiritually lined up in the God, you're not thinking about the verse that's going to help take away the headache. Is it still going to hurt in the meantime? Yeah, but it'll take care of it in the long run. It's going to hurt now, but it'll be gone before I know it. But if I'm not spiritually thinking, what am I going to have to do? Suffer through the headache. And then you're sitting there wondering, well, why am I getting, getting a headache? Well, it could be because of your sinuses. It could be because you're addicted to caffeine and you haven't had a caffeine yet. That's the first thing I drink in the morning after my glass of milk that I usually drink with my Pop-Tarts. After that, it's a Diet Mountain Dew when I'm out the door on the way to work. Why? Because, one, that's the only diet drink that I can stand, and I don't want diabetes, so I had to cut sugar out of my drinks. And two, because it's got the most caffeine of any soft drink on the market. Because I need it. Why? Because if not, I'm going to be real grumpy real quick when that headache kicks in. So I don't, it was also a whole lot cheaper than drinking Starbucks every morning. So I went with diamond. But what am I saying? There's a whole lot of reasons you can get a headache. Could be because you're just stressed out. Could be because you didn't get enough sleep the next day. But whatever the reason is, there's something that can take it away. Now, Advil doesn't do you too good if you don't have none on you, Brother Mike. A leave isn't going to help joint pain if you don't have it on you. Right? Well, if I know that I need it, well, do I carry Advil on me at all times? No, but I know where it is at the house. I bought a whole big jar of it for the office. Why? Because before I showed up, Sheila called them my magic pills. And I'm like, that makes it sound like I'm peddling drugs. It's just ibuprofen. It's just Advil. They didn't have none. One day I got a headache. What did I do? I ran to Kroger's, got a big bottle, and brought it back. I'm like, here, headache cure. It's also an anti-inflammatory. If my back started acting up, Advil. Is it going to solve it? No, but it'll help me get through it till I can get to the solution. What's that? It's on the front of your bulletins today, I do believe, unless I'm mistaken. Thine word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Well, thy word have I also hid in my heart so that when I start hurting, it doesn't become crippling. Amen. I've hid his word in my heart so that when people do evil to me, I can remember, do blessings unto them. His word I've hid in my heart so that I can stay as close to God as I can right now. How do we do that? Sanctify God in your heart. Reserve everything that is you for God to use. In those days when he says, do this, and the flesh doesn't want to do it, remember, I gave all of me to him. I've been bought with a price. I didn't just give him my heart. I gave him my hands. I gave him my arms. Gave him my mouth. Gave him my feet. He's got all of me. So if I say no, I get further away from God. Why do we sanctify God's in our heart? Because I don't want to be further away from God than I have to be. I know I can't really, in the flesh, be right next to Him because I'm here and He's in heaven. But one day I will be. But spiritually, I can be right next to Him because He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He said, take His yoke upon us. What's that mean? He's right next to me. But if I get out of the yoke, he's not there anymore. If I say, Lord, no, I'm not pulling that, the Lord's going to keep going. What's all that mean? If I give him all of me, he's got to have all of me for me to be right next to him. So I don't look at it as doing good to others so that I receive good. I get all the good I can handle by being next to God. That's what I'm focused on. 
He blesses me, pressed down, shaking, bubbling over. Daily he loadeth me with benefits. The harm that people try to do to me doesn't compare in all the good that God does for me every day. So I'm not worried about what the world thinks of me or what I receive from the world. I'm having good days. I'm loving life. And I'm having the best time of my life just being next to Him. So I don't want anything to come between me and Him. Amen. Those that see only the benefits from the world in the verses that we read are people that have gotten so far away from God they forget how good it is just being next to God. I can have the worst day of my life, but if God's there with me the entire time, it's a good day. That's why when people try to persecute me, try to kill me as it might be. I can suffer but I'm still going to be happy. Why? Because I've sanctified God in my heart. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.